Amen. Amen. Okay, you can be seated. Yeah, pray uh, that we get good use out of that playground. And uh, just uh, another prayer, we're asking the Lord if he would want us to start a daycare here. So ask the Lord to show us that. Uh, Song of Solomon. And we're going to look at those verses tonight. You don't have an outline. Uh, again, I'm robbing that from you, just encouraging you to jot down notes if you are so inclined. But here in this book, over and over again, we're going to see it. It's going to be something we're going to become familiar with. You know, when you see two people who are in love, let me ask you, how can you tell? What gives it away when two people are in love? You see them, and you don't even necessarily know them, but you can tell. Raise your hand if you can tell me something. How? Yeah, they don't really have eyes for much else. They're pretty fixated on, on each other. That's certainly going to be true in our text tonight, all the way through this book. What else? Yeah. They're glowing. Okay. Somebody else? You, you can tell someone's in love because that's it, glowing and fixated. Okay. Huh? They touch each other. Okay. They like to touch each other. Yeah? They tend to focus on the other person with other people. They don't seem to have much, uh, they don't think about much of anything else, and they love to talk about the person that they love. Okay? Good. Anybody else? Yeah. They see the best in the other person. That's a really good insight. That's a really good insight. Okay? Yeah? They're inseparable. They don't want to be apart, even for any length of time at all. Yeah? Yeah? They're always smiling. Okay? You can tell someone's love because... Anybody else? They laugh a lot. <laughs> well... I think it becomes kind of obvious to us, not only when somebody else is in love, but when you're in love. Let me ask you this. I'm not asking you to raise your hand. Are you in love? Are you in love? My question kind of tonight and over this series is going to be, do you love Jesus or are you in love with Jesus? You say, well, that's the same thing. Oh, no, it's not. For a wife or a husband to ask the other, do you love me? Are you in love with me? Those are two separate questions. And if you try to deny that, you're deceiving yourself. Remember Jesus said to that church at Ephesus, I have but one thing against you. You have left what? Your first love. He didn't say you don't love me. You don't love me like you did at the first. There in the book of Jeremiah, God speaks to his people, Israel. And here's what he says. I remember your betrothals. Uh, you, you get betrothed, that means you get engaged. I remember when we first got engaged, he says, to the nation of Israel. When you went after me, in a land that was not sown. He's talking about the wilderness. He's talking about after Moses led them out, they were freshly saved. God was presenting himself in a pillar of cloud by day, a pillar of fire by night. He was providing water out of the rock and bread from heaven. Their clothes weren't wearing out, and they were on this adventure of going to the promised land. It, it, was, it was a crazy new life, but it was exciting. And God and his people were getting to know each other. And God says, man, I remember that. And what he's clearly saying there in Jeremiah now, many, many years later, after the people have started to worship idols, is I miss those days. I still love you passionately like that. But like Jesus said to the church at Ephesus, that's not where your heart is anymore. So somebody said, and it's true, when two people are in love, they're thinking constantly about the other. And that's happening in our text. You can't miss it. You can't wait to hang out or be with them if there's something that takes you away. And you imagine even what the future will be like if you're just starting out. Really, what's it going to be like when we're even closer and we spend more time? Becky and I had just gone out 
I don't know, just two or three or four times. And I remember I came over and she was writing something down on a piece of paper. And I said, what are you writing? She said, oh, nothing. She shouldn't have said that because I probably would have not noticed if, if she hadn't tried to put it away. But as soon as she tried to put it away, I said, well, no, what is that? She goes, oh, nothing. And then I said, no, no, I want to see it. Well, you know how, what happened. I kind of demanded, and she didn't. She kind of was trying to hide it. And we were being playful, but I finally got it out of her hand. And you know what it was? She had written her name, Becky. Her last name was Olson. But she had written over and over again, Becky Copany. And it was like she was a little, felt a little funny about me seeing that. And I felt great about that. <laughs> you see, you get excited about What's the future going to be like with this person? I can't wait. For, I'm enjoying it now, but I can't wait. There's more. And that's what it ought to be like in your relationship with Jesus. I love the way it is now for me to live as Christ, but to die, oh, it's even going to be better, you know. I can't wait to heaven, but it's awesome now. Well, some principles from this passage about the beautiful relationship that we have with the Lord. Uh, if you want to jot something down, I'll give you the... They're not fill-ins, but I'll give you some principles. First of all, see yourself, if you want to fall back in love with them, see yourself as his treasure, as his treasure. This is where it starts. To me, my darling, you're like, this is the bridegroom speaking, you're like my mare among the chariots of Pharaoh. Your cheeks are lovely with ornaments, your neck with strings of beads. We'll make for you ornaments of gold with beads of silver. If you're taking down notes, Malachi 3.17 comes to mind. Here's what God says of his people. They will be my people, saith the Lord of heaven. And on that day when I act in judgment, they will be my own special treasure. I'll spare them as a father spares an obedient child. Now, it does catch our attention that he says she's like his mare. Um, but please, let's realize he didn't compare her to a donkey, okay, or, you know, a monkey or something. I mean, he compares her to, to a horse. You know, I, I heard somebody say years ago the advice that they'd give after years of marriage and that their marriage was kind of an example. He said, treat your wife as a thoroughbred and she'll never become an old nag, you know. Um, but here's what you got to remember. Solomon speaking, this is Israel, this is the ancient world, and horses are very rare, and by the way, very expensive, okay? So this is not a put down that he says, I think of you, I see you like my mare among Pharaoh's chariots, because this isn't just an average horse anyway. We're talking about Pharaoh's chariots. See, this is the top model, okay? <laughs> it, it, a very unique horse that would have been used for Pharaoh's chariots. Remember, Solomon bought horses uh, at 150 uh, shekels of silver apiece, and chariots for 600, we're told in Chronicles. So he was one who bought these expensive models. It's kind of like comparing uh, your wife to, uh, I don't know, a Lamborghini or a Ferrari, you know, something very special, it's kind of rare, very valuable is, is the idea here. Um, another very interesting thing when you think about Solomon uh, buying these uh, horses, bringing these horses out of Egypt, is you have an interesting picture too. He's buying these horses out of Egypt. Egypt in the Bible is a picture of what? Type of the world. Remember the children of Israel were enslaved to the world. Pharaoh becomes a, a type of, of Satan in a sense. And so the true Solomon, according to the New Testament, is Jesus, remember? He, he said, you, you know, uh, the Queen of Sheba came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon in her day. And someone greater than Solomon is right here. It's him. Jesus is our Solomon, the one who is the Prince of Peace. That's what Solomon means. So in, in a very sense, Christ's bride has been redeemed out of spiritual Egypt at an infinite price. Jot down 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19. Peter says, knowing this, you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your feudal way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. So the first thing is we got to start to see ourselves as special to the Lord. I don't know if you see yourself as special. 
I don't know if you feel special at all. But here's, here's, the, here's the contrast between the way the bride sees herself at the beginning of this book and the way her bridegroom sees her. So you can write this down somewhere. She sees that she has been beautified by him. She sees, she starts to see she has been beautified. She is falling in love. She's in love with him, but she sees how much she is loved by him. You're like my mare among the chariots of Pharaoh. And then he, he starts to say, your cheeks are lovely with ornaments, your neck with strings of beads, but notice who's making her beautiful. We will make for you. This isn't something she's doing for herself. We will make for you. Uh, ladies, I don't know if, if you have somebody that puts makeup on you. I mean, usually it's people that are wealthy or people that can go get their hair done and their makeup done and somebody, you know, you know movie stars, I guess, do that, you know. Mo most of us, you know, we kind of take, take care of our own self-serve kind of thing, right, you know, um, to make ourselves attractive. And, and yet uh, this bride has already told us at the beginning uh, of this book she was, she had no, uh, she had nothing going for herself that she could see. Remember, she starts the book by saying, I was, I'm black but I'm beautiful. She was black because she was sunburned because she worked out in the fields. We said that wasn't a racist comment at all, but it meant that she was from the lower classes of the, of the blue collar workers who just had to work in the fields. And here she is being attracted to and attracted uh, by and attractive to uh, the king. And so it's very interesting, but she has been beautified by him. Jot down Ezekiel 16 and verse 11. God says this of his people, I adorned you with ornaments. I put bracelets on your hands and a necklace around your neck. If you read there in Ezekiel, God describes his relationship with his people. He says, on the day that you were born, you were like a miscarriage or like a, a, a baby that nobody wanted that was left on the side of the road still in your blood. In other words, like a baby that was born and the mom didn't even want her and, and she's there dying. Squir he says, squirming in your blood going to die in Ezekiel 16. So that's when I found you, and I looked at you, and I said, live, live. The relationship of God with his people always begins with his mercy, his undeserved mercy. Nothing in us that's desirable to anybody, but God has chosen to put his grace and his mercy. First, she's saved by him from death through mercy, and then adorned by him through pure grace. And so we have the care and the love of God being beautifying. You know, it, it, we've studied this in Proverbs. Jot down Proverbs 4 and verse 9. Proverbs 4 and verse 9. It says of wisdom there, she will place on your head a garland of grace. It's talking about why you should want wisdom in your life and seek after wisdom. If you have it, she will place on your head a garland of grace. She will present you with a crown of beauty. And we have discovered, we who have studied Proverbs, what is ultimately the wisdom of God? Let me rephrase it. Who is the wisdom of God? 1 Corinthians 1.30, it's the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what the Lord will do for your life. He will bring the wisdom of God to you and he will beautify your life. Talk about a complete makeover, divine edition. That's what the Lord Jesus does in every one of his lives. What does the old song say? Uh, ruined lives and broken people. That's why you died on Calvary. You know, I, I wish we had time sometime just to go around the room and say, you know what? Uh, without getting into too much detail, here's what I used to be like. You ever seen a cardboard testimony? Did you go to the Harvest Crusade this year? You ever seen those where somebody just takes a phrase to describe drug dealer? born again, child of God, and they simply in a phrase describe what they used to be in their BC days. We've got a lot of ex-sinners in this room. We've got a few contemporary current ones too, but, but the fact is, <laughs> the Lord's in the process. of. T aren't you glad you're not what you used to be and you never have to be that again? You never have to go back. Aren't you glad that you're not even tempted, some of you, even tempted at all? It's like you walk by somebody smoking marijuana, you don't have to hold yourself back at all. It's not like, you know, maybe you used to feel that way. Or you go by a bar and you really want to go, you know, it's like, not, not at all. You know, it's the unhappy hour, you know, not interested at all. Uh, the things that used to have a, a hold on your life have been broken. And the Lord Jesus is making you more into his image. Well, 
Another principle then in verses 12 through 14, there becomes a sweetness in our relationship with him, a sweetness. What does the old song say? Sweet. He gets sweeter and sweeter as the days go by. Oh, what a love between my Lord and I. I keep falling in love with him over and over and over again. Verse 12, while the king was at his table, she says, my perfume gave forth its fragrance. My beloved is to me, she says, a pouch of myrrh which lies there in my breast, between my breast all night. My beloved is to me a cluster of henna blossoms in the vineyards of En Gedi. Now, it's interesting. At his table, his fragrance becomes her adornment. I love that. The Lord's intention is for us to come often to his table. And there remember his sacrifice. And it is in that communing with Jesus as your sacrificed Savior, the Lamb of God, that we find ourselves falling back in love with him again. We become intimate with him, and suddenly we not only fall in love with him, but we become more like him. Now it's interesting. Look back in verse 3 and 4 of of chapter 1. She says there, Your oils have a pleasing fragrance, Your name is like purified oil, therefore the maidens love you. Draw me after you and let us run together. And then she says that the king has brought me into his chambers. And so we're studying about an intimate relationship of a bridegroom and a bride, kind of newlyweds, we might say. And we're saying, Lord, I I want that to be typical of my relationship with you. Here in verse 13, she says, my beloved is to me as a pouch of of myrrh. When you think of myrrh in the Bible, what do you think of? What is it associated with? Think of a passage or think of some association with myrrh. What do you what comes to mind? Raise your hand if you want to answer that because I don't know who's yes, sir. I, I couldn't quite hear you. Say again. When Jesus was crucified. Oh, he was offered, uh, you're talking about the vinegar, the vinegar to keep for the, for the, with gall in it, or, or myrrh, so as a, as a sedative. Okay, what else? Yes, right here. Little gifts of the right, the, the magi brought gold, frankincense, and not diapers, but myrrh, yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, so that's an interesting gift, a very expensive spice. Where, where else do we find myrrh related to Jesus? Anybody? Raise your hand. I'm not sure who's saying it. Yeah. Herod? His burial. Exactly. Uh, Joseph of Arimathea begged the body of Jesus from Pilate and then buried him with a hundred pounds of aloes, spices, and myrrh. Very expensive embalming. It's very interesting to be affiliated with Jesus from his birth to his his death. And here we have it coming up again in relationship um, to the bridegroom. It's, It's an interesting thing. If you want to be in love, if you want to stay in love with Jesus, it's going to involve your coming to his table, like communion, contemplating and meditating on his sacrifice, what he's done for you. Paul says, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me, (laughs) and how did he prove it? He delivered himself up for me. God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. They're all, the, there in 2 Corinthians 5, Paul says, the love of Christ constrains me or controls me, having concluded this, that one died for all, that they who live should no longer live for themselves. Do you see the relationship? As I think about, as I contemplate, as I focus on the sacrifice that he's made for me personally, not just for us theologically, but for me personally, that's where in my heart, becomes affectionate, it responds. And when your heart becomes cold, you've distanced, that's just become truth that you know about but you're not living in anymore. Verse 14, now it's interesting, now she's talking, she says, my beloved is to me a cluster of henna blossoms in the vineyards of En Gedi. Now, first she talks about myrrh between her breast in the dark. In night, in night. That's an intimate time alone. I'm in love with him when I'm all by myself. 
when I'm going through the darkest times in my life, when nobody else can see me, I'm still in love with him. But now she's talking about something that is visible to other people. She's talking about the wearing of these white and yellow, beautiful flowers that are found there in the oasis of En Gedi. How many of you have been to En Gedi in this room? All right, the rest of you got to get on board and we got to take you there. Uh, it's, right, it's right near the Dead Sea down by Masada. And uh, we do a hike that goes out to a, a cave where David hid himself from Saul. And we have some, a great Bible study there. But there's an oasis of water out in the middle of just dry, barren, dead everything. And uh, wild goats out there and the rock badge. It's an amazing place. But there in the vineyards of En Gedi, where we grow these beautiful flowers in the vineyards, these white and yellow flowers that the maidens of the time would wear in their hair. And so she uh, compares herself uh, uh, to that when uh, she says there, look at verse 14, my beloved is to me a cluster of henna blossoms in the vineyards of En Gedi. I, in other words, I want other people to see that I'm in love with you. See, somebody said this a few minutes ago. I said, how do you know when somebody's in love? They said, well, they just want to talk about that person. Is that one of the evidences that we're in love with Jesus? That we want to talk about him? I think so. What did they say to the apostles, we gave you strict orders not to speak anymore in this man's name, this Jesus who's dead. And you remember what they said? Well, first I said we ought to obey God rather than men. But they said, we can't stop speaking the things we've seen and heard. They didn't say we'd, we'd prefer not to or we were told not to. We said we can't. We've got to keep talking about him. Did you ever see that commercial? I don't even know what it was for. Probably diamonds. But it was a uh, a guy, it looks like he's in some piazza, up some plaza in Europe or, I don't know, some large city. And uh, he stands up and he shouts, I'm in love with this woman! It's like, nobody asked you. But it didn't matter. He's so excited about his love relationship with this woman, he is ready to tell the whole world. Can I say, we need that back. We need to stop being so concerned with what other people think about us. But we will be until we fall in love so much with the Lord that it's our driving passion. She says, I wear these flowers in my hair because I want everybody to give me an excuse to talk about, about you. You know, um, Moses in Psalm 90 uh, says this. He says, let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us. And I think that there's the, here's the idea, that Jesus Christ is altogether beautiful. Like the old hymn says, beautiful Savior. That's who he is. We are not. We don't start out that way. But the Lord is conforming us into his image, and he's putting upon us the favor or the beauty of the Lord. Jot down John 12 and verse 3. This is the account, remember, when Mary comes, and she takes her very expensive spikenard and about a pound of it, uh, and, and puts it on, uh, anoints Jesus' feet. Um, it says, Mary then took a pound of very costly perfume, of pure nard, and anointed the feet of Jesus, and she wiped his feet with her hair, and then the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. And of course, the disciples and Judas complained that they should have sold it, it was a waste, and Jesus actually defends her, remember? What did Jesus say about what she did, why she did that? She was... She anointed me for my burial, which is a fascinating thing. Did Mary understand? According to Jesus, he gave her credit for it. Jesus defends her, honors her, blesses her, says this story is going to be told about her wherever we go. It's going to get in my book. This sacrificial love, this love, that's another thing. That when you love somebody, you sacrifice. You want it. You don't care. There's no, money is no object. But it's interesting. She pours this spikenard on his feet. She wipes his feet with her hair, and suddenly there are just two people in that room that have that fragrance on them, Jesus and her. They smell the same. Here's what Paul says, is we're to bring the fragrance of Christ wherever we go. People should smell Jesus on us because we've been spending time with him. They should sense the love of God in you the joy of the Lord, the peace of God. Those are all the characteristics that Jesus brought. Those are the fruit of the Spirit. 
There's an old song written by John Wimber that says, Consider how he loves you. His arms of love enfold you like a sweet, sweet perfume. He left his word to guide us. His presence lives inside us like a sweet, sweet perfume. Don't ever think you're worthless. You have his life within. You're a sweet, wholesome fragrance, so valuable to him. I love that. And then if you're going to jot something down, put this down. Our love for him is a response to his love for us. Our love for him is a response to his love for us. Look at verse 15. How beautiful are you, my darling. This is the bridegroom talking now. This is Jesus, if you will. How beautiful are you, my darling. How beautiful you are. Your eyes are like doves. And then she responds, How handsome you are, my beloved, and so pleasant. Indeed, our couch is luxuriant. The beams of our houses, our cedars, our rafters, our cypresses. Well, some principles, uh, if you want to jot them down. She sees herself as black. That's how she started. But he simply sees her as beautiful. Very interesting. She sees herself in her natural condition as blackened. He sees her as beautiful. You know, it's interesting. The king only has good things to say about her. Somebody said, when you're in love with somebody, you only see the good. You know, you only can see something to commend them and, and to encourage them. And the same is absolutely true of that. We look at ourselves, and if we're honest, we say, yuck. I don't like what I see at all. You know, I'm not just talking physical. You know, we include that too. But certainly spiritually, we go, man, I'm, I'm the chief sinner, Paul said. He doesn't say I used to be either, by the way. He said he was still. Did you know that? But Jesus describes the bride as the pearl of great price for which he went and sold all. That's before he died, before we were changed. He saw the bride as the pearl of great price. Uh, later on in this book, we'll have that phrase, I am my beloved's, and his desire is for me. Wow. Do you really believe the Lord likes you? Wants to date you? Wants to hang out with you? Wants to spend time with you? That he'd rather be with you than hang out with the angels? Do you really believe it? He does. It's interesting when he's writing, Paul is writing to the uh, Ephesians, he's praying for them that their eyes would be open, uh, opened, and he says, I want you to know what is the glory of your inheritance. Uh, or he doesn't say, I'm sorry. He says, I want you to know what is the glory of his inheritance in you. You'd expect him to say, I want you to know what your inheritance is in heaven or what you have in the Lord. He says, no, I want you to know but his inheritance is in you. You're God's inheritance. Anybody ever inherited anything in this room? Good for you. Some of us, you know, I got some fake pearls once. I don't know why anybody left me those, but it's like, I don't want to give them to Bob. Anyway, but anyway, <laughs> uh, I, never even, I never even gave them away because they just weren't <laughs> worth anything. But, um, but we're not some cheap inheritance for Jesus. So how do we get there? How do we get back? Put this down if you're writing notes. Meditate more on his love for you, his great love for you. What you've got to see in our text, and it happens right in verses 15 through 17, is there is a response. He starts out, how beautiful you are, my darling, how beautiful you are, your eyes are like doves, and suddenly we start to see her respond to it. The Bible says we love because what? Yeah, he first loved us. Now listen. It's great to talk about loving Jesus. I think it's wonderful if you can say, I love the Lord. And it's important that you can honestly realize you do. And you're to, I, When's the last time you said, I love you, Jesus? If you haven't said that in a while, I'd encourage you to start saying it again. But focusing on how much you love Jesus can be dangerous because it's probably going to ebb and flow and maybe a little more ebbing than flowing sometimes someone said um, thinking about our love for the lord is a more dangerous thing to think about than his love for us 
<laughs> That's really, really true. Um, there are two foot races in the Bible that come to mind. In the Old Testament, there's one, and there's one in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, uh, it's a couple of guys uh, racing uh, who are delivering a message concerning a battle. And uh, one is commanded to go and run and tell David. And, and his, he's a messenger. His name is Cushy. I don't know if he had a cushy job, but his name was Cushy or Cushai. And he runs. He's commanded to go tell uh, David uh, that uh, Absalom has been killed. But after he starts to run, Ahimahaz asks permission too. He says, I want to run. I want to go tell David. And Ahimahaz runs, but Ahimahaz is of a different kind of a personality toward David. And Ahimahaz loves David. And you know what? Ahimahaz outruns Cushy and gets to David first. Cushy, just running because it's his job. Ahimahaz is running because of a passion. He wants to be the one that breaks the news about Absalom to David. He, want, he loves David. Interesting. In the New Testament, the women come and say the grave is empty. Peter and John, remember, are told Easter Sunday morning. And they run. They run. It's a race. Who gets there first? Who? Peter comes in second, dead last. There's only two. Very interesting. Peter has convinced himself before Jesus goes to the cross that he uniquely loved him. I love you so much. I, all these guys might deny you. I would never deny you. I love you. I'll die for you. And so Jesus has to ask him after the resurrection, Peter, do you really love me with sacrificial agape love? Ah, uh, well, I kind of love you like a friend. Remember? Peter makes all the boasts, but John describes himself in his gospel as the one whom Jesus loved. Interesting. You focus on how much you love the Lord, and you're not going to have the passion to carry out this Christian life. You focus instead on how much he loves you, and you'll find the power to live for him. You know, the little book of Jude, I mentioned it on Sunday because of the message he decided to write. But in that book, it's very interesting. When he's talking about falling away from the Lord, he doesn't say, keep yourself loving God. You know what he says? Keep yourself in the love of God. Keep yourself in the place where you keep remembering that's why jesus you know he said one command he didn't say remember you've sinned no he said remember me that's all remember me but it's so easy to get our eyes on the wrong things uh philip bliss wrote a a number of christian songs back in the time of d.l moody that they would sing at these evangelistic services and um he wrote one that you may have heard uh, i know we were still singing in the 70s uh, there is a name i love to hear I love to sing its worth. It sounds like music in my ears, right? You know that song? Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus because he first loved me. And it was a very popular song during the 1850s and 60s when D.L. Moody was preaching. That's how old that song is. It lasted quite a while. But one time as he was hearing the crowd sing that song, it bothered him that it seemed like they were always singing about their love for Jesus, which was okay, he said, but he felt like that wasn't where the focus ought to be. So he wrote another hymn, one that you may not know as well, probably not as popular as the one that talks about how much I love Jesus. But in this second song, it, it says this, I am so glad that my Father in heaven tells of his love in the book he has given. Wonderful things in the Bible I see, but this is the greatest that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves even me. Oh, that needs to be our focus. Well, jot this down. Hear him speak to you and let him hear from you. Because instead of just talking about the Lord, 
there starts to be communication back between the two of them in verses 15 and 16. Now, the bride and the groom aren't just praising him to other people, which is a part of loving somebody. When you love somebody, you talk to other people. But now the focus is they're really starting to, to talk, talk directly to each other. You know, it's good to come to church and praise the Lord. It's part of what we're to do. We need to be around each other. We need to be in the Word. We need to be taught. We need fellowship for sure. But we need to go beyond publicly praising the Lord and go to a deeper level of personally communicating to Him. Telling Him yourself, I love you and here's why, Jesus. I thank you. We need to listen to Him. We need to speak to Him. And then if you want to jot it down, He sees in you what you can't see in yourself. Uh, it's interesting to me, in verse 15, He says, your eyes are like what? Doves. Now think about it. You know, in the ancient world, they didn't have mirrors like you and I have. The mirrors were not very good. That's why Paul would say in 1 Corinthians 13, though now we see through a mirror dimly, because the mirrors weren't like perfect. They were uh, poor reflections. So you didn't get to really see yourself. Other people could see you. You know, if I have something on my eye, you might see it. I can't see it. We're talking. And so what's interesting to me is he sees her eyes and comments on them, but that would be something she necess wouldn't necessarily see. She's seeing herself through his eyes. Now, what I love about the fact is that the bridegroom is seeing the bride with having eyes of a dove. And who is the dove a type and a symbol of in the Bible? The Holy Spirit. Remember, the Spirit of God descended upon Jesus at his baptism in the form of a dove. That's how John the Baptist knew. This is going all through the Bible, the, the picture of the character of God. You know, the Bible says, be wise as serpents, but innocent as doves. We have this beautiful picture of the bride having eyes of a dove, and it's coming from the bridegroom. She's not seeing that herself. You know, um, one of the fruit of the Holy Spirit is meekness let me ask you what does it mean to be meek when you hear that word we don't use that term too much you know but what, it, what does it mean to be meek somebody give us a yeah controlled strength yes uh one of the meanings of this word proutes which is meek is that of power under control so a stallion that has been a wild stallion that's been broken and domesticated and now it's using its power under the control of somebody else. What else? Meek. If someone's meek, what do you think of? Humble. Jesus said this in Matthew 11. He said, if anyone is uh, weary, come to me and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am gentle. And the word in Greek is the same word, proutes. I am meek and lowly of heart. Those are uh, parallel words. So it's power under control, but it's that sense of humility. The God's spirit, she has eyes of a dove. Part of that character is to become meek. You know, I, I love what Chuck Smith used to say. You say, you say, you don't have to know Greek to understand uh, the word meek. He said it works perfectly in English. Meek is me, ick. It's just perfect, you know. It's that not focusing on yourself. I think of Moses. Talk about not seeing. When you're meek, you probably won't know you're meek. Think about Moses. He goes up and he's in the presence of God. The Bible says he's the meekest man on earth. And the Bible says his faith, his face glowed. But it doesn't say he came down going, hey, check out my face. He hadn't seen his face. It wasn't like it was glowing and he could see it. Everybody else could see it, but he couldn't see it. I think of Gideon. Remember Gideon in Judges chapter 6 where... Um, the angel of the Lord appears to Gideon. Remember, the Midianites have enslaved the children of Israel. And God's going to raise up. This is Gideon's call. This is when he first gets called into the ministry. And uh, he's not thinking he should you know, start a revival or anything else. Uh, he's just trying to live out his life without making too much of a problem for the enemy. In fact, he's hiding. He's, he's winnowing his wheat in a wine vat, which should speak volumes as to his fear. He's doing it in a place where you can't really do it. There's no wind in a wine vat. That's where he's doing it. And the angel of the Lord comes and appears to him at this wine vat, 
And he says these words to Gideon. The Lord is with you, O valiant warrior. He's not even a, he's not even a soldier. The Lord is with you, O valiant warrior. And, and I'm sure Gideon thought, where'd you get that? And who are you talking to? <laughs> but the Lord could see in him what he could not see in himself. Can I say one of the cool things is if you spent some time with the Lord, you might think he would just point out all your flaws, but he wouldn't. He would point out all of the characteristics in you that he's already worked into you, that he is so excited about. He sees the Spirit of God working in you and through you that you either minimize, have forgotten, or you can't see. But the Lord sees and commends his bride for them. And then finally put this down. Praise him, if you're going to jot it down, praise him for the rest you find in his house. For the rest we find in his house. Verse 16. How handsome. This is the bride now. How handsome you are, my beloved. And you're so pleasant. Indeed, our couch is luxuriant. Um, by the way, the word luxuriant in Hebrew is the word green. So they had a green couch. No, that's not what it means. Um, she's talking about the fact that he's a shepherd. They're outside. It's talking about grass. And when it's uh, the place where we recline is we're talking about the fields. Uh, think about what David says there in Psalm 23. Um, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down where? Green pastures, you see. He, 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 get, he brings me to a place of rest. She's, she's admiring and, and thankful for her bridegroom because of the rest that he has brought into her life. And then she goes on to describe, she goes from the couch uh, to the house. She says there in verse 70, the beams of our houses are cedars and our rafters are cypresses. Now, cedars and cypresses speak of obviously expensive. This is not cheap veneer. This is not the stuff you buy at Home Depot to finish off your wall with cheap wood. This is the real stuff, the expensive stuff, solid uh, wood. In other words, our house is not something that's shaky or poorly built. I want you to jot down Psalm 46, uh, verses 1 through 4, and it's talking about security. Here's what the psalmist says. God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change, and though the mountains slip into the heart of the sea. Uh, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains quake at its swelling pride, Selah, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy dwelling places of the Most High. So he here's, here's what she is doing. She's saying, first of all, you bring me a place of refreshment and rest. That's what our couch is. But also, I live with you. Our houses are built of solid, expensive, quality wood. Now, what's interesting is she begins this chapter. But look back in chapter 1, verse 5. She says, I am black but lovely, O daughters of Jerusalem, like the tents of Kedar. When she starts to describe herself initially, she's saying I'm black, not only in the color, but this idea of the tent. I'm, she's affiliated not with a solid structure, but something that can be blown over uh, by the winds, you know. But now that she's in relationship with him, she's in this place of, of total security. I, I love the song that we sing sometimes uh, b based on what Paul wrote in Philippians, that he who began a good work in you will complete it to the day of Jesus. And here's what some of the lines say. If the struggle you're facing is slowly replacing your hope with despair, or if the process is long and you're losing your song in the night, you can be sure that the Lord has his hand on you safe and secure. He will never abandon you. You are his treasure, and he finds his pleasure in you. I love that. This bride has come to be aware that her bridegroom is bringing her to a place of rest in her life that she did not know before, comfort, but also security as she is now in his house. And by the way, I love the fact that she says, our house. But it, remember what she said in John 14? I go to prepare a place for you. In my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. But I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, what? You may be also. When you get married, whatever you married into becomes common property. And I, I've often said this. You know, when, when my 
uh, pastor uh, declared Becky, my wife, and me, her husband, though we didn't exchange anything right there other than the rings, there was a lot more that was going on legally. Suddenly, everything that I had became hers. Everything. My great wealth. Okay. My 72 Nova. But I did. We, I had an apartment. We, we made keys for her and for me. Keys to the car. She needed, we only had one car, so. She didn't want to ride my skateboard. I didn't have a skateboard. I'm kidding. But everything I had was hers. See, do you know what happens? Not just someday in heaven. Well, <laughs> right now. Everything. See, the psalmist says he owns the cattle on a thousand hills, the wealth of every mine. The old hymn says it too. He owns the rivers and the rocks and rills, the sun and the moon that shine, wonderful riches more than tongue can tell. He's my father. They're mine as well. Whether you use the analogy of father, son, or husband, wife, everything that's his is yours. His house Listen, I think a lot of Christians make this mistake of thinking, well, I'm a Christian, so I get to go to heaven. They almost picture it as like Disneyland, you know? Holiest place on earth, or whatever. I'm going to go to the New Jerusalem, and I'm going to show my season pass, or something. I'm going to get in because, I, you know, I have a stamp of Jesus on my hand, and uh, like you're going to be a guest in the kingdom. Get to go on every ride. Can I tell you something? You're not a guest. You're not a visitor. You're the bride of the bridegroom. You own the place. Do you understand? I don't think we do. I don't think it'll really dawn on us till we get there. We're, we'd just be content to be in the choir. See, some of us have never been asked to be in a choir our whole life. Some of you have been. Good for you. I remember in fourth grade when the music teacher had all of the kids go over to the uh, multi-purpose room and she sang, she played a few notes on the piano. She just asked us to sing, God bless America, some, whatever it was. And she only needed just a, a, you to sing a couple lines for her to know whether you were going to be in the school choir. Me and two other kids were the only ones the entire semester who played games while everybody else sang <laughs> in the school choir. And I'm not healed. No, I'm just kidding. I don't care. <laughs> Fact is, we're not going to just get to be in the choir in heaven. That would be wonderful. That'll be great. But God has so much more for you. Listen, here's what I want to do. We're going to close. We're going to have the worship team come back up. We're going to come forward just so you can wake up. And we're going to sing one last song, but, or a couple songs. We have enough time. Come on up forward and we'll finish. Here, here's what I want you to do tonight. I, I want you just to be honest about how things are between you and the Lord. I started tonight by saying, by asking a question. I said, do you love the Lord? Now listen, that's kind of a tricky question. You say, what do you mean? Well, when Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? Clearly, there were some issues that had to be resolved because Peter answers, but what does Jesus say as soon as Peter says yes? He asks him a second time. Now if I said to you, Randy, do you love me? Might be a strange question but we're best friends, and you answered me, but I asked you again, you might feel like, I just answered you, Bob. What do they say in court? Asked and answered. I object. Three times Jesus asked the exact same question. And so can I tell you something? It's easier for you to say, I'm good there, Bob. I'm fine. I love the Lord. But what if he keeps asking you? On your way home tonight, I, I want you to allow the Lord to ask you that question. He's not asking you to make you feel bad. He's not. But he doesn't want you just to say, everything's cool, Lord. See you in heaven. We're good. Thank you for dying for me. Because he's passionate about you. Can I ask it another way? You ever been in love with somebody who wasn't in love with you? And I can tell you if you've ever had that experience. And some of you go, oh, yes, I've known that. Some of you are going, I know that right now. 
Maybe you have a deep love for one of your children who don't, don't want you in their life. Maybe you've loved a spouse who stopped loving you. But I can tell you this much. If you love somebody with your whole heart who doesn't love you back, then that's a consuming passion for you. And that's the way the Lord feels about every one of us here. I want you back. Can I tell you something? Nobody else on this planet has more of a right to your heart and your affection than Jesus. He has a right to it. And can I tell you something else? Until you're back in love with him, you're going to find this life to be oh so less than it was designed to be. Because you don't, you're not living for the one person who is worthy of your affection. You're not worthy of it. Sorry to say it. You'll never be fulfilled by living for yourself or anybody else. So maybe we just need to say tonight, Lord, I'm not sure where I stand with you. Or we need to say, I'm not where I want to be. Not where, not where you are toward me. So Lord, stir me afresh. He's, by the way, he wrote a prescription of how to get back there. Just, I'll give you that and then we'll sing. I promise. <coughs> he said to that church at Ephesus, remember from where you have fallen. That was number one. In other words, admit that you're not where you used to be. For some of us, that's where we've got to start. Two, he said repent, which means to change your mind. And then thirdly, he said, do the deed you did at first. What was it like when you used to be in love? Well, I used to talk to him in the morning. I used to talk to him on the way to work. I used to sing songs to him. Start doing it. I think they still have music on the radio and CDs and stuff on your phone. Go download a love song and enjoy it tomorrow morning. Read his word tomorrow or tonight. Talk to him before you go to bed. Wake up and say, good morning, Lord. I'm ready to start that adventure afresh. Let's sing together. No greater love has ever been or ever will be shown that our Lord would die, lay down.
when you're out of gas. Um, it can be scary if you don't know where to get gas. Becky and I were coming through Nevada. Never do this <laughs> on a motorcycle. I think it's Highway 93. Nobody who rides a motorcycle designed that few of gas stations between each other. Anyway, it's a long story that I don't want to tell you, but it was uh, a question whether we were going to just become skeletons in the middle of the desert because <laughs> there was 110 degrees out and just nothing. But uh, when you're out, when you're when you're dr when you're empty, you just need to know where to go to get filled. That that sounds pretty simple, doesn't it? You just need to know where to go to get filled. Jesus said, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. I'm not going to shame you because you're thirsty. He's going to bless you <laughs> because you're willing to admit it. You say, but Bob, I'm really dry. I'm cold spiritually. I'm dry spiritually. Okay. Let me ask you something. What do you think the best kindling in the world is? Stuff that's really dry. I don't care how dry you are. God says he is a consuming fire. You just get yourself close to him and you will catch. Don't sit there and bemoan that you're dry and that you're empty and I don't know how I got here. Who cares how you got here? The question is, how long do you want to stay there? Seek the Lord. Tell him. Say, God, I'm dry. I'm apathetic. I couldn't care less. What Bob said didn't touch me at all. Lord, your word didn't minister to me tonight. But I have a sense maybe it's not your word, Lord. It's my heart. It's hard. God says, I'll give you a new heart. I'll take away your heart of stone and I'll give you a heart of flesh that's beating for me. Ask him. He wants him more than you do. Let me pray for us. Father, I do ask that as we are looking into the mirror of two people that are passionately in love with each other, and Lord, as we see what we perhaps once were or what we've never been but we want to be, as we look into the Song of Solomon and see a bridegroom who is passionately in love with and enjoying his bride, praising his bride, and a bride who can't stop talking about her bridegroom, Lord, would you make us, as we, not just as we study it, but as we pursue you, as we ask you to help us pursue you, as we respond to your love with a love in kind, you make us go after you in the wilderness that we're in afresh lord to not be afraid when anybody thinks about us but to be so in love with you we can't stop telling people about you but help us to just start by telling you we're sorry lord for growing cold we're sorry for getting busy we're sorry for being focused on ourselves. but jesus thank you that you don't want to waste our time groveling in guilt you want to pour on us grace and a crown of beauty so forgive us draw us near to yourself and set us on fire afresh for we ask it in jesus name amen god bless you